Hey, everybody. Bob Babbitt here, uh, host of Breakfast with Bob, among other things. And this is the Tri Summit, inspiring, entertaining, educational sessions created so you can achieve your personal bests. In 2021, after a pretty hard 2020 for all of us, this session of Tri Summit is called Get Sleeker to Get Faster, and it's brought to you by DeBoer. Uh, DeBoer, the fastest, most comfortable wetsuits in the world. And I know all, th all four of us are on board with that. I want to introduce our amazing guests. From the athletic perspective, we've got the reigning Challenge Daytona cha champion, took home 100K for that big win back in December, and 2019 Ironman 70.3 world champion, Gustav Eiden. We've got a legendary cycling coach and former pro cyclist, Hunter Allen, and hydrodynamics expert and founder of DeBoer Wetsuits, Mr. Alex DeBoer. And Alex, since the session is named after you, we're going to start with you. Talk a little bit about Thank your you. background in, in getting in the wetsuits and trying to make them faster. Well, it's a, I'll try to make it as short as possible, because <laughs> otherwise the show will probably be changing. 25 years long, but uh, yeah, in 1990, 1995, long time ago, uh, started by actually importing Ironman wetsuits into, into Europe. Just fell in love with rubber and all the technology behind it. And um, yeah, today we are actually in 2019, we, uh, we founded the brand The Boer Wetsuits. And uh, yeah, the one... So while we're fixing that, let's go over to Gustav. Gustav, talk a little bit about uh, what, what I love is you go to 70.3 Worlds and you're the only guy out there on a road bike, right? And you win that race. And then you go to Daytona and you have to sit in an aero position for 50 miles, totally different game. Talk a little bit about how you work to set your bike up correctly so that you, know, you, you were able to win both races. Uh, to be honest, I didn't do too much bike positioning scientifically before both of those races, actually. Um, so for the first race, I only used what I had at hand. So I had, uh, I had a TT bike and a road bike, but I choose the road bike because of uh, simplicity, because doing it simple is often much faster than trying to navigate like these hard things. So keeping it simple. Uh, that's one of the reasons I chose the road bike in, uh, in Nice. But um, efficiency through the air, it's actually more than just aerodynamics. And a road bike, to be comfortable and like smooth through the cornering, can be more efficient through the wind than just thinking pure aerodynamics. So that's why yeah, I, I rode famously on a road bike there. And for Daytona, did you spend a ton of time in the aero position and do some wind tunnel testing? Because obviously that was an important race and a totally different position for you. Yeah, I had planned with the Giant to do the wind tunnel, but uh, with the COVID restrictions and everything, it was impossible. And we don't have any, uh, anything like that in Norway. We don't even have a velodrome to get some simpler error testing on. So I just, uh, I just went by feeling actually in uh, Daytona, but I have been on the bike for so many years, even though I'm quite young. So my feeling for aerodynamic is actually really good. And that's confirmed now because uh, just a few days ago, we actually went to a velodrome for the first time in my life. And uh, basically everything that I thought was aerodynamic on my bike, it was correct. So uh, my feeling of the wind on the bike is pretty good. Uh, but it's really nice to have it confirmed with hard data. So going from the Olympic format and the, the you know, draft legal uh, using you know, road bikes and then moving to the aero position, did you find it, that it was difficult to run off the bike or was it, was it okay? Um, yeah, it, it was tough, especially in the start of the run to, uh, to, get, to get the running like started. But uh, I'm not sure if it was only that like pure aerodynamic position or that position was too long in one stretch. I think also my back would hurt on a road bike to be like locked down like that for such a long time. But uh, I definitely could <laughs> have some more training going into Daytona on my TT bike because as you said, 
I normally raced on a road bike and changing to a TT bike, even though they may, might look quite similar, the position is not that similar. So Hunter is a guy who's been at the cutting edge of, of using power. Talk a little about your, when you realized, okay, there's some metrics here that we maybe are not using that could make a huge difference in, in not only triathletes, but in, in road cyclists as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, some of the metrics that we've come up with, with training with power have been really important. Number one, uh, one of the things that, uh, that we, we, we did was we put a score on every workout and every ride, every race. So training stress score gives us a way to talk about in a common language, how much training stress you accumulate in a ride and a training ride or in a race. Then two, um, Dr. Coggin came up with a thing called normalized power, which basically measures the amount of power that you would produce uh, over a period of time if you pedaled smoothly. So, for example, if you went up and down a bunch of hills, your average power takes into account all the zero time, the time you're not pedaling. But then normalized power helps to, to smooth out that and look at the metabolic cost, which your body's doing. And so one of the things that came out of normalized power that we really weren't um, – trying to get in, in, in this kind of thing back in 2003, 2004, 2005, when we were developing all these tools was, um, a tool called the, uh, um, uh, variability index. And, and that came from normalized power divided by average power. And that helped us to understand, um, you know, how variable or how many bursts, um, you did in a ride. And so for triathlon, that's really important because you want to minimize your bursty nature, you know, and um, that just saving the muscle glycogen for your ride, for your run afterwards is so, so critical. So that was really interesting. I mean, again, it was kind of, you know, we, we, we set out to when we were really developing all these tools, you know, 20 years ago, trying to figure out, um, a lot of different things and we're just presenting them to the, to the, you know, the public and said, Hey, what do you think of this? And, and all of a sudden other tools came from that. So that is one of the, the couple of metrics that you might really be used to when you see a training with, in a power meter itself and on the bike or afterwards. So there's, when we think of aero helmets, aero frames, uh, sleeve tri kits, shaving hair, all the little things that people try. I remember guys used to drill out their brake levers and all sorts of different things. What works and what doesn't? From, from a power perspective, I mean, the things that are really critical are you've got to have great wheels. You've got to have a really clean arrow frame. And it's been really exciting to see a lot of these companies now hide all of the cables. I mean, in the triathlon mm. world, they've been doing this for a while, but now everybody's getting super serious about hiding the cables because it takes three watts of energy to push a cable through the air. <laughs> so wow. if you've got yeah. three or four of these cables, you know, you're handicapping yourself by 12 watts, which doesn't seem like a lot, but over a period of a full Ironman, that could be a huge difference then in terms of how much energy you're saving at the end. So those are really critical. A helmet is absolutely critical, you know, and I can't emphasize enough about the, the position of the helmet. So many people you see watching, watching them ride with their helmets, their helmets are poking straight up in the air when they get in their actual <laughs> position. <laughs> They're creating more resistance. Um, so it's really critical to, to get a lot of these things dialed in and look at it from that perspective, because as, as we all know here, you know, the, the most important factor that is the, you know, that we have to deal with is aerodynamic resistance. And so if we can minimize that in everything we do, then 300 watts, 250 watts, 200 watts, whatever you average for your event is going to make you ride faster. What was fascinating to me when I look back at, like you say, 89, 90, when Mark Allen and Dave Scott were like the, the, at the top of their game, their swim time and run times are pretty similar to what they're doing now. But they were riding 428 in Kona, and now they're going 408. Uh, do you, uh, uh, is most of that just being aware of aerodynamics and the cables and the rest of it? I think that it probably plays a role in, in a lot of that, right? So I think that certainly the aerodynamics is, is really vastly improved and since that time. And then two, our training has become way more scientific. I mean, mm. it really has. I mean, back then, you know, 
some of them, some people use heart rate monitors, some people didn't, you know, they just use their speedometers and they didn't have downloadable data to see, well, should I train again today or should I not train, you know, the next day? How many intervals should I do? Should I do 10 intervals? Should I do 15 intervals? Uh, and, and then also peaking, right? Now we really understand how to peak for an event. Uh, and, and, and that was a big discovery because we, we have always known the athletes who have, are always good at a certain period of time. And then sometimes, you know, you have athletes who just kind of are randomly on form and they peak. And then other times there's like, this guy always crushes it in May, or this guy always does amazing in July. And, and we really defined like how to peak using a power meter. And, and that's, that's a, a massive, massive change because as a coach, you know, to me, the Holy grail is when an athlete, Gustav, anybody comes to me and says, Hey, you know what, on this day, I want to have the best ride of my life. And you give them everything you can. You have the right amount of fitness. You have the right freshness. You give them exactly what they need on that day to have that magic day. It's up to them to do the pedaling, right? And do all of the right things. <laughs> right. But and just to shoot in on that. Uh... Got on, it. A, on a training and a power meter, just like you said, like uh, it's not only the equipment it's now with the sensors and everything for training. So I can just put in an example, uh, a totally normal training day for me, yeah. or a, a totally normal training ride, not even a hard ride, every ride. I use a heart rate monitor. I, of course, use a, uh, a power meter. I use a core temperature sensor and I use a blood uh, moxie or moxie sensor, which measures the blood oxygen for every ride. And this is four parameters they didn't use at all back in the time. So I have such a control over everything that's happening in my body at all times in training. And that's, uh, that's something that's come a long way since the back in the days. So Gustav, for you, are there, has there been times where one of the, one of those meters is showing you something that, Oh my God, I'm tired. And you were, didn't even realize, did you learn something um, that, that kept you from maybe overtraining? Um, no, because I feel like all the sensors are just calibrating my fatigue index even more. So I, I have never been like at a step where I felt like too fatigued to keep going. And I still looked mm. at the number afterwards and then I saw something was wrong. I always try to use the numbers to never get that fatigued. So, but it's really interesting to see uh, how the numbers produce, uh, like, for example, in altitude where you can see what part of the body is lacking at that time. So going to altitude, of course, you want to raise like the red blood cells and everything to transport more oxygen. But why are you feeling slower in altitude? And then you can look at the data. It's not the heart rate. The heart rate is the same. The power is the same. But then you look at the MOXIE sensor, which measures the um, blood oxygen, and that's much lower. So then you know, okay, it's the blood oxygen that's too low to push harder so that you kind of know what to train for and how to train to get even better all the time. So, so Alex, let's get back into the water. Talk a little bit about the, the changes in hydrodynamics over the years with, with wetsuits and, and where you're at now. How much better can you get? Yeah, I must admit over the last uh, 10 years, I always questioned myself that when we came up with something new that I was kind of surprised. And, and, uh, and I mean to say, I mean, me measuring uh, swimming compared to, for example, power meters or in, you know, with cycling, it's a little harder to measure because you need a lot more data. You need to go into, into pools like we go into the laboratory of Eindhoven. They do drag tests. Um, you can do, uh, you know, we have diving tests, buoyancies. We do video analysis. So how far can you go? I mean, at the end of the line, we have... Fortunately and unfortunately, we have the restrictions yeah, within the ITU, ETU, Ironman, that five millimeter is the max. So mm -hmm. we, you start to play with it. So one of our secrets is the whale skin. The whale skin is actually a seven millimeter neoprene compressed to five. So we, we generate more buoyancy out of the entire wetsuit by having basically a thicker wetsuit. But when you measure it, it is five millimeters. Um, by changing the composition of the of the rubber, uh, back in the days we used um, um, I'm losing the name oil like oil based neoprene. Now mm -hmm. it's limestone, so it's grain grains 
stones actually, which is the base of the neoprene, which makes the neoprene lighter, is more, more flexible, it's more buoyant. Uh, so all these little things all together makes the wetsuit faster and, and more testing. And also the availability, and what I just, now you got these pedals, you know, where you can test uh, the, the pressure uh, when you swim. Now that yes. helps us a lot for measuring where to make the wetsuit, uh, give the wetsuit, for example, more or less buoyancy because it also is individual. Of course, when we make wetsuits, uh, you kind of make them for everybody. So we did testing between a very good swimmer back in the days uh, where it all started with was be with Benjamin Sanson. I think mm -hmm. the oldies in our in, in this conversation remember, and and actually myself. So I'm an in my good times <laughs> a one twenty hundred meter swimmer, pushing like crazy, and Ben going fifty seconds, and then <laughs> working working on the body position. And after testing and testing and making actually sixteen wetsuits and finding out where the buoyancy is the most important is actually in the hip area. Uh, my body position at some point was about the same as Ben's, but I'm still not swimming 50, 50 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so something went wrong, but uh, it is very interesting to learn. That's why I'm actually getting over all these years more and more excited. And now we're working on a new wetsuit, the Fjord 2.0, and again, we, we came out with something that we say, hey, we can make that wetsuit lighter. So it's more water absorption now. It's the buoyancy, it's the composition. So it's constantly trying to change things and also minor little things, how much, how much water you get in your wetsuit, mm -hmm. uh, other little pieces. It's almost like aerodynamics or it is like their aerodynamics. Yeah. You know, when you bike and you have your helmet, your aero helmet, but the con you constantly actually have your hat in the wrong position. It's the same for a wetsuit. So we need to find things that the water runs smooth and all that stuff. So uh, talk a little bit about swim skin as well, because obviously in, in a lot of races, especially Kona, you're not allowed to use a wetsuit to use yeah. a, a swim skin. How have those evolved? Well, that is an interesting story. I mean, over all these years, the you know they first started with just having Lycra uh, swim swimsuits almost with an, with a little bit of with a, a water repellent coating on it. Um, then then the fabrics changed. Then we got this time that we all remember that all there was world records mm. every day almost with yep. swimming because then they allowed these buoyant neoprene actually a neoprene based swim skins. Um, then the Fina turned it off and and we had to go back to to nylon based. Uh, mm -hmm. fabrics that obviously did put us a little bit in a smaller window of innovation to be very honest so the way we do it is a little bit different as well we normally you put a, um, a coating on one side of your of your fabric because that's the way the machine is built but we gen we made a machine where you actually can coat it from two sides so it doesn't absorb the water from the outside Yep. Nor, nor from the inside. But the big difference um, is not good promotion, what I say now, but there's not so, so much difference between swim skins. I mean, the, 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 gain, the gain in time is, is, is far less than the gain between a wetsuit and a Debour wetsuit, for example. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, Gustav, are you thinking this year, uh, since you're, you are qualified for Kona, will you be doing hopefully the Olympics and Kona? Yeah, hopefully both uh, races will be on and both, hopefully both races will uh, be a good show and I can be able to perform uh, on both days. So uh, I had that plan for, for last year, for 2020, to uh, do both races. So I'm just going to copy paste and try to do the same this year. <laughs> when somebody talks about free speed and, you know, the helmet and everything else, how much time do you spend on that, looking at all the other equipment? on the bike to make sure that your bike is as fast as possible? Yeah, efficiency for me is, uh, it's key. And it's actually been uh, a mantra for me the last four weeks. I have uh, kind of, I'm not reached a peak at all in my training, but I am, I am, I am maybe the best trained athlete, but my efficiency isn't uh, at the best yet. So I think uh, if you think free speed, 
many people are thinking like uh, yeah like the ceramic speed bearings and stuff like mm. this but uh, for me efficiency it's uh, it's much more than that it's choosing the right lines for racing for example choosing mm. the right turns and yeah, of course being aerodynamics because aerodynamics is uh, is such a huge part so uh, and also efficiency like in the muscular movements how you can you sit efficiently on a bike so that the pedal stroke, uh, even though you're producing 100 watts, the 100 watts are going like in the right direction of the pedal stroke. So you're not losing any power in the transmission there. So that's for me, it's like free speed and efficiency. Love it. Hunter, when back in the day, I remember when, when Lance was winning the tour, obviously uh, we had some other things going on. But one of the things he did that was pretty cool, that whole Formula One team where he took, he says, I've got, he brought Giro together with Trek and Oakley and was like, everything needs to work together. I need the helmet and the glasses, everything that, to connect so that I'm as aerodynamically as humanly possible. Have you seen more athletes and more companies working together that way? You know, I think that's going to be an interesting thing that we'll, we'll start to see even more. So um, I think that the convergence, just just taking something really simple that, that was talked about for years and years, right? The phone and the camera, right? That convergence into our, our current smartphones, mm-hmm. right? Has been a big piece of that. And we're seeing those kind of, those kind of things converge as well in a um, maybe you know, they're, they're all working in the same device, right? For example, if you have a Garmin head unit or something, um, you know, we can get so much data out of 10 different devices and more and more out there that, you know, there are companies that I'm working with that, that are two or three years away from producing their product, but they, we've already got their, their, their data in a Garmin device that I can download and look at it. And it's like, wow, this is really cool here. We're seeing these kind of metrics Um, that are going to hit the public in two or three years. So I think that is the piece that's really that we're starting to see from a data analytics standpoint is, is making that happen because ultimately what was happened, right? What a power meter is, 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 it has become the ultimate data acquisition device, you know, and because power is the, the ultimate direct determinant of performance velocity, right? It is, if your FTP is 300 and you move it to 320, you're going to go faster, right? It's the ultimate for direct determinant of performance velocity. But, you know, it's a data acquisition device. We got GPS, we got heart rate, we got cadence, we got speed, we got left and right power, like Gustav was talking about. We've got all these things that are coming into that. I think that's going to even continue as we see other sensors that are coming on board for our bodies and also our bicycles and parts of our bicycles. So I'm sure through the years when, when all of this was power meters, you, you wrote the book uh, and, and people who were traditional cyclists were probably like, nah, 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 nah. And I'm sure you've dealt with some of those over the years. Who are some of the folks who originally were like, no way, that'll never catch on to now <laughs> Tell me what's next, Hunter. I need to know that what the next give, what the next thing is. I need to have on my bike. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny. Um, there are some there's some pretty famous folks uh, that I met in Kona actually that said that uh, that told me at a lunch, invited me to lunch. I'm not going to tell them tell you who they were, but they That's invited okay. me to lunch and and uh, sat me down and said power meters are never going to be adopted by anybody. It's all about heart rate. And uh, I was like, okay, (laughs) good. (laughs) You're you're, going to have him on in in uh, in another show. Actually, he'll be around. Um, I love it. And uh, anyhow, but no, there's going to be some really cool stuff coming out. Um, You know, one thing that I can tell you uh, is is we haven't done a lot of work on respiration. Um, Our breathing is really, really critical. Um, nobody's done any work in this area. We've done work in motion analysis. I've spent a bunch of time working on that. We've done work in lots of other areas, but I think that respiration tied in with a couple of other in key metrics are, is going to be very, very interesting in the future as we start to learn how can we use our minute ventilation to help us in training um, and how does that starting to impact other types of uh, of metrics that we're going to start looking at. So that's just one. 
Gustav, for you, was were you always a tech guy? Were you always into the numbers? Or was it all of a sudden you're racing and training and going, wait a second, this guy's doing this and he's having results. What was for you? When did you decide that, hey, I, I, numbers are power? Oh, I think you might be muted. Oh, oops. We, I think we lost you for a second. We'll go, we'll go, I'm sure we'll get you back. Alex, uh, the cool thing about what, but people don't think about it now, but the, the freedom that wetsuits gave people and allowed people to get into our sport. Because back in the day, a body of water that was 60 degrees, people wouldn't be racing. How important do you think the wetsuit has been to the growth of the sport? I think actually, especially this year, meaning COVID-19 year, has changed even much more to it. I mean, behind me, I mean, probably you don't, uh, people don't can't see it later, but it's the ocean wetsuit that changed the whole world of swimming. I mean, Gustav, for sure, can can back me up. He uh, he made together with Christian a cool video where they were, they were breaking the ice, literally, and start swimming. And first they were, I mean, I really had a really had a lot of fun watching that video from you guys, and uh, I was like, actually, really like you guys are nuts. But then afterwards, they actually liked it, and then, and we have a ton. I mean, honestly, a ton of sales since October. We launched the wetsuit with Jan, Jan Frodino, and uh, and first people were a little bit laughing, like, yeah, it's not real. But honestly, I get daily and still daily people who are swimming out like in three, four five Celsius water for an hour, no problem. And they love it. So it actually does bring more people into swimming. Of course, when you have swimming pools, you can swim, but however, but the other side is that we get more other people to the sport because now people who normally would just go for that open water swim, they now get excited to do triathlon. So it does help the sport and it does help actually keep people trained uh, yeah, 365 days a year. Thermofur, what, what is that? Yeah, so we, we uh, innovated, I would say, a new inner lining. And that lining has a special, yeah, how do you say it? A special way of, of the, the way they actually create it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it keeps the, the, the heat longer in the suit. And behind it, also between the thermal layer the thermofur and the neoprene, we put a special coating, which is which is like basically an isolation coating from, and that, that keeps the body warmer than normally within a, within a wetsuit. Gustav, we have you back? Yeah, I think I'm never gone, but uh, I'm oh, back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so when know. did you become a numbers guy? And I want to know more about that breaking the ice and, and swimming in freaking frigid water. Well, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I've always uh, been a, a nerd, and I always liked the numbers. And math was my favorite subject in school, besides gym. Uh, but just like Hunter said, respiration, I think that's the future of sensors. And uh, it's not the future anymore, because our team has already started working on it. And uh, I, right now, sometimes use a, a portable VO2 device that can measure my uh, liters per minute and liters per breath. And I get everything, as you said, synced up to my Garmin device so I can see the efficiency in my uh, muscles. And not only how many watts I'm pushing, but the relation between how much I'm breathing and how much, much watts I'm pushing. So I can see the muscular efficiency at live at my Garmin as I'm pedaling. And then I can always like improve my pedal stroke to make it more and more efficient. But that's a kind of like a hassle to deal with. So swimming so, in frigid water. Uh, talk a little bit about getting into because you're in you know, Norway. You're you're you you. It's cold in a lot of places you go to. So uh, swimming yeah. in cold water, you're getting, <laughs> getting more into that. Yeah, first me and Christian, who has just signed with the uh, Bore now. Um, yeah. We only thought about doing this uh, like publicity th stunt and do something for the pictures because it yeah. was minus 16 Celsius back home <laughs> there. So we just thought, okay, 
just a quick dip in and out and then we're done. We are only doing this for a sponsor, so we don't really want to be outside in the water. But then we came into the ocean and it was ice, but it didn't really feel the cold. It was amazing. And with the socks and the gloves on, you could swim. Like you could swim in the water. But the problem was my face, I was not prepared. And uh, since it was for a photo shoot, I would normally take some like Vaseline in my face, but for a photo shoot, eh, you can't really do it. So if I like prepare more, I could swim. I could swim like a training session in, uh, in icy waters. So the suit is really something else. That's unbelievable. Hunter, you, we've seen the growth over the years since you and I are sort of the old dogs in, in this. Uh, we've seen you know, mountain bikes come in. We've seen now gravel bikes. How do, you, how do you change the way you train people depending on what bike they're riding? Well, you know, that's, that's a great question, Bob, because we always, the number one principle that I always look at is we train the athlete to the demands of the event. So you have to define the demands of the event first and then train them to those demands. So one great use of a power meter was just go out and do a race, go out and do a mountain bike race, do a gravel race, and let's just capture the data. Let's figure out what the demands of the event are, and then we'll train to those demands. So, you know, that's the first step of the process of that discovery process. For example, mountain biking it requires you to push a lot harder with more force at a slower cadence. So we need to make sure we're training with more force and a slower cadence. Road racing in a criterium or something, this is the opposite where you push with less force, but really quickly. Um, triathlon is kind of in between those two places where you're not trying to put a lot of force on the pedals, but you, and you're not trying to spin quickly and you're not trying to spin very slowly either. So it's kind of this balanced blend in triathlon uh, to, to do. So I think that that's where, you know, you have to always think about like, what, how do we change this for this specific discipline and what are those demands first? Um, and, and even within triathlon, right? Uh, the way that you would train for a sprint triathlon versus a, a draft legal triathlon versus an Ironman triathlon is pretty different in, in terms of cycling. I mean, they're different, completely different demands. And then the course demands, Ironman Wisconsin, totally different than Ironman Florida, right? So you're going to train those athletes differently. And so when you're, when you are training an athlete, the, the specific course, that's what you're training for, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, and that's exactly what I do. I, I try and search out. I mean, I have power files now from, I think every Ironman around the world. So I've got the, the data to kind of look back at and say, okay, well, what did, um, you know, an elite woman do? What did a master's woman do? I've got this, this lady who's going to do this. What, what can I think she can do in between these? And then we go and, and research and figure out exactly what that course demands are. And then we start training to that. So we know when she gets there, she will be able to hop on the bike, know her pacing, right? Back to your, th your question about free speed, right? What's free speed in cycling from my perspective? It's, it's pacing, right? Because if you know what your pace is for your specific distance, for the specific obstacles in the course, then that's free speed. And it doesn't, most people don't think about that as free speed, but if you go too hard on one section, don't have it for another section or go too easy on, on one section, and then you finish too fresh, um, oh man, I could have done better, right? Um, you know, that, that's a huge mistake. So that to me is free speed. So always focusing on our pacing and, and that course is so critical. So Gustav, one of the sort of new metrics has been running with power. Is that something that you make use of? Yeah, I've been using the power meter strid sensor or stride sensor for, I think, a couple of years already. I was one of the first ones to really started using it. But personally, I don't use the data too much. Mm. Um, it's something our sports scientists look at if our form is degrading or if some strange reason the pace and power and everything doesn't really align up then we kind of use it to look into what's wrong. But for me, running has become, is, is really natural for me. So I haven't used it to find like, to be more efficient, but uh, I use it to, uh, to pace myself on, 
on not flat roads or if it's a lot of wind then it could be nice to pace yourself uh, from power instead of pace because running uphill how hard is it really you don't know until you look at the power numbers so uh, that's how i use this uh, power while running so when you were training for 70.3 world at nice that that course is so different because it's got the big climb and it's got the downhill and I think a lot of people think about the climb and they don't realize the importance of the downhill. If you're by yourself on the downhill, you can go a lot faster than if you're with, with other people. How did you train specifically for that race? So I went straight from the grand final in uh, Lausanne just yep. to, to fly down to Nice. So I got some extra time in the course. And that's one of the things I think made me a winner there because I really knew the course. I did uh, four days of just riding the course, even though I might have needed more rest after such a big uh, event in uh, Lausanne, I still decided I needed to know the course. And you don't get the same feeling if you ride uh, a car. So I needed to go by myself, find the course and just train in it. And in the downhill, I was super relaxed. I guess my heart rate went below 90 in a race. And that's not something that's normal for me. <laughs> was racing average heart rate on a run at 180, I think. So uh, I could really relax down the hill because I really know every twist and turn. And also, as you said, uh, Hunter, with, um, with the pacing, we also use the tool Best Bike Split, which is like a website. You can just plot in a course and then it will kind of give you the optimal pacing depending on weather and hills and everything. So it's a, it's a great tool. So it, it seems like you're the type of guy who's always looking for that next tool. What do you, was there one that really surprised you, something you had heard about, and then you started using it and you're like, oh my God, I love this. Um, no, it's, I, I can't think of anything right now, but uh, I think uh, lactate measurements, it's uh, something that many people are trying to use, but uh, are kind of blinded by the numbers. So I think that's kind of a hype thing the lactate measurements, but if you can do it right, then it's the absolute gold standard. So you mentioned being in Nice and, and training on that course and how important it is. And, and, and that course in Kona is one of those that, that people feel that they, because the wind changes every day and the, the hills and the rest of it. Is that something you'll try to get there <laughs> and, and train on, those, on that hill, on those, that, that course? Uh, yeah. So uh, I have a, a training plan going into... Uh, into Kona, so I haven't fully landed it how to do with uh, every, every place we're going to train, but uh, I will for sure try out the course before race day. It will be absolute stupidity to come to Kona and don't uh, know the demands of the course. So hopefully yeah. Christian yeah. will also qualify, so me and him can go together and uh, really prepare for that race as best as we can. Well, and we've had a lot of people who've had great success first time out on that course. You know, Luke Van Lerda, I don't think he had ever run a marathon before or done 112 mile bike ride when he came over and broke the course record in 90, 96. <laughs> so there, there, there's certainly some history there of people coming over and have immediate success. And you certainly have, you certainly have the goods to do that. What would it mean to you to, to you've you know, won 70.3 world? What would it mean to you to win Kona? Uh, it would be... Uh... It's kind of weird to say, but almost too easy to do it on the first try. So I kind of hope I don't manage to do it first try because then it's kind of like, uh, well, now I've done everything. So uh, hopefully I will, I, ha I will have a bit of a struggle there, but uh, hopefully not also. But uh, it would be such, a, such an amazing story to be able to win there. Absolutely. Alex, as somebody who's been in this sport for, since the earth was cooling, and you know, brought the first Ironman wetsuits over to uh, over uh, to Europe. Talk a little bit about just you know, for yourself. Are you still racing? Are you still training? Is this, do you still love it as much? Oh yeah, I still love it as much. I mean, uh, over the years, uh, I mean to brag a little bit. I mean, not to all the. I mean, I know against you, Bob. I'm uh, I'm a rookie, but I did six Ironmans and, and multiple halves, and still training. I mean, obviously this year has been a little bit different than others. But normally speaking, I like to do one or two races a little bit more towards the end because I like training more than racing, to be very honest. Although I love racing day, but the whole struggle 
all this, the little bit of stress around it. But I, I need to have a goal. And uh, yeah, now I'm, at, to be honest, at the moment, I'm a little bit injured on my heel. So I'm actually every day on, uh, on the indoor bike trainer uh, for about an hour or so and, uh, and can't swim. So uh, uh, to be honest, even though uh, Gustav, you guys uh, <laughs> tried it in the really cold water and we do have the equipment, I'm not attempted yet, but uh, when it comes down the, in the double digits, then I'll definitely jump in uh, in the wetsuit. So, uh, but yeah, still uh, still very active. Can't wait to come to Kona, and uh, if Kona goes on this year, and then Gustav, uh, what you just said about yeah, you don't hope. Maybe I tell you something. You better you better make it. <laughs> <laughs> I will for sure I'll be, try my I'll best. Be waiting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> And Hunter, you still you still racing and training, and do you learn from yourself when you're? Because uh, obviously you've been doing this a long time. Do you are there things you take from your own training and racing that you uh, incorporate into the books you write and the athletes you train? Oh um, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest things you have to have is as a coach, you have to have that personal relationship with the data. You have to understand what it means. And so for me now, it's more about looking at, at, at these new devices and, and what am I learning from those things based on all of the past experience and intervals and training and, and fatigue and, and, and that perspective. So that's what keeps me uh, excited and fascinated about it is, is what can I learn new? What is the next thing that I can do? What can I, what can I uh, discover that can help, you know, thousands and millions of more cyclists and triathletes out there. Um, and I'm, I'm still training right now. I'm, I'm uh, I just did a training camp last week with uh, some clients. That was super fun. And I've got some other training camps coming up. Unfortunately, I was, uh, I was all signed up, um, to do trans Portugal. So Gustav, where you are in Portugal, uh, there was a big race, an eight day mountain bike stage race across Portugal. And they unfortunately canceled that, but, uh, I am signed up to do the first ever, uh, Machu Picchu mountain bike stage race in Peru in October. So I'm hoping to, uh, to go to Peru and, and ride up to Machu Picchu, uh, and do that. So that's my big, big goal for the year. So, Hunter, have you had uh, and a lot of coaches will tell me that, that they'll, they'll, an athlete will come to them and they'll, they'll have some goal, which seems ridiculous for them. They have no background. They've never ridden a bike. And I want to do Ironman. I want to I want to do it under 11 hours, whatever it happens to be. Hey, I'm, I'm guessing you've got a, a couple of those type of stories of, of athletes who maybe surprised you with what they right. accomplished, considering where they started. Yeah. You know, so usually the, the folks that come with come to me like that are unrealistic in the time frame that it's going to take them They yeah. They are realistic in the fact that they can do it. Um, it just takes work and it takes a more a longer time frame. So uh, I once coached an athlete, uh, a really great master's athlete, uh, and he came to me very, um, you know, kind of out of shape. Uh, his FTP was low. He was 40 pounds overweight and said, you know, gosh, I want to do an Ironman and I want to do it this year. And it was March. And it was like, oh, you know, and, I, and you know, not only that, I want to do it in this time. And I was like, man, we got a lot of work to do here to, to get you to an Ironman to finish this, much less get it in a time. Um, and so it took us a couple of years, but we, we achieved that goal. And that was super fun because, you know, it, it inspires me as a coach, right? Those are the, the athletes that I love coaching. They're engaged. They want to see their numbers. They want to improve. They're seeing that that improvement every week. Um, and that's super fun to coach. I just, I just love doing that. So, uh, absolutely. It's, it's always a, a pleasure to take somebody with, um, and I call them my big hairy goals, right? It's like when you're a little kid, there's the big hairy monster under your bed. Right. Um, and so I call them my big hairy goals and you gotta have, I think, uh, back to your kind of point, Alex too, you gotta have a goal. I'm highly goal oriented and it's got it for me goals now, right. Are, um, they have to cost money, right. So I have to spend money. Um, they have to have travel cause I like to travel. So it's like, Oh man, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm going to spend a bunch of money. And then they have to be hard enough and scary enough that like, if I don't train, this is going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. So if, if they if they if they meet all those requirements, then that's that's a great goal for me. Yeah, and, and our goals our goals for Gustav are a gold medal and an Ironman uh, podium. How about that? I don't want to. Those, I mean, those are big hairy that ones. There's yeah. a reason to come Here back. Here he goes. Yeah, yeah. But, but my Gustav, goal is know, to. Yeah. If yeah, my goal is even more uh, hairy with uh, doing the double with the both Olympics and Kona at the same year. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I love it. I mean, if you're going to be on the podium in Kona, you might as well not be looking up at anybody, right? You yeah, might I as might well as well win, I guess. Down. Yeah. 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 I love it. Hey, I want to thank all three of you guys. So much fun to chat with you guys. This session uh, has been a blast and uh, it's been called getting sleeker to get faster. And obviously you guys brought some great material to the table. Thank you. Thanks to Alex and Gustav and Hunter. You guys are the best. Stay healthy. Uh, the next session of the Tri Summit is coming up tomorrow night and it's called performance metrics to master in 2021 with Olympian Katie Zafaris and her coach Joel Filio presented by Polar. See you then. Have a great night and a huge thank you to our um, sponsor of this session, um, Mr. DeBoer. Alex, thank you so much for sponsoring the session and being part of Tri Summit. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll see everybody in Kona. Take yes. care, everybody. See you. See you at Kona. <laughs> see you.